Thank you, Javier. Um, we are now ready for the Q&A session. Uh, again, would you please wait, raise your hand, wait for the handheld mic, and um, say who you are. Um, the questions can be addressed. I, I, would, I would hope you don't say you want everybody to answer your question because we won't get to enough questions. So I, I may, if you don't address it to a particular person, I may arbitrarily pick a, a person to um, answer it. And if anybody else needs to chip, to say something, uh, that, that's okay. Okay, who would like to start off? Yes. Joe, yeah. Keep, keep your hand up, please, so that the person can see person with the mic can see where you are. Uh, Joseph Mann, I'm a business writer based in Fort Lauderdale. I have a question for Javier about Venezuela. Uh, Javier, could you talk a little bit about the presence, the power, and the penetration of the Cubans in the, in the Chavista party and in the military and uh, security apparatus? Thank you. Thank you. Answer yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, um, I don't have more new information than I have been having. Um, there is a large presence of Cuban technical and security as well as cultural and sports experts um, in Venezuela. The, uh, and Brian Latell is here and Brian has written as well as many of you have written enormously on how uh, the, um, the Cuban revolution since its, 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 its very beginning has wanted to have Venezuela and it makes total sense because it is a great energy machine uh, oil, and it has obtained it with Chavez. Um, most analysts agree that the choice for Maduro is Cuba's choice. Um, Maduro, long before Chavez, had a, um, a history of political activism and, and labor agitation that was apparently known in Cuba. So I think that these ties are going to survive uh, more so if we get insecure Chavismo. What is so interesting is that Capriles hasn't made that big a deal of it. He did make a big deal, the opposition candidate, on the fact that so much of Venezuela's sovereignty is being determined in Havana. But the whole idea of kicking the Cubans out drastically is not part of his agenda. And I think it's because he realizes that um, uh, there is an aspect of Venezuela-Cuban relations that has been beneficial for uh, Venezuelans in general. Although, of course, he knows that it has also been politically beneficial. So, uh, you know, the most important technical advisor uh, at the moment for the government has got to be Cuba. And, um, and I think those ties will stay the same if Maduro is uh, elected. And, and the ties with, like, Petro Caribe, those, those will go, or? Well, you know, the, except for the subsidies to Cuba, Petro Caribe doesn't cost Venezuela that much. Um, so it would be one of those things that it would be too, too dirty on the part of Venezuela to say no to them for the savings that it would generate. The problems that Venezuela has are much bigger, and so I think they will protect that simply because it produces um, 14 or 15 interesting votes in international <laughs> uh, units. But it's not that costly to um, no, uh, 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 Venezuela. Thank you. Um, question over here. Good morning, Karim Besson. How do you I'm, foresee? I'm sorry. Who, who Karim? are you? And, and do you have, a, if you have an affiliation, please? Yes, say. the professor of Miami Dade College. Okay. Uh, how do you foresee, Mr. Corrales, the future of Venezuela if Capriles wins? Well, <laughs> um, there are two issues. Um, he will unfortunately have to deal with economic adjustment, and who wants that <laughs> as president? This will be very difficult. He will be immediately accused of being a neoliberal, simply because he's going to have to engage in austerity. So, so prepare for very, very, very tough, very tough um, Chavismo opposition. Um, no honeymoons. Um, the second thing that I foresee is that while Capriles has been extraordinary in producing an electoral coalition, it is very important to keep in mind that in Latin America, except in a few cases here and there, the opposition tends to fragment, especially competing against the incumbent president. And that was the tendency in Venezuela, and Capriles contained it. But it's not clear once he becomes a president how easy that electoral coalition will um, become uh, a governing coalition. So, so this is not going to be easy. 
um, uh, um, uh, this will be very difficult. On the other hand, on the other hand, Capriles has a policy recommendation that would be terrific in getting him out of economic trouble. And that is not completely out, but that is a reform of the oil sector. The reform of the oil sector in Venezuela does not require a constitutional overhaul because in Venezuela, unlike uh, in Mexico, uh, it is allowed to have private investments, private participation. It's the institutional uh, uh, um, groundwork is done. What has not been there is the political desire by the government to allow the right private interest to collaborate. Capriles can use the legal framework that's in place and easily introduce a lot of innovation in the oil sector and produce a turnaround in the productivity of the oil sector. The productivity of the oil sector in Venezuela is collapsed. Very quickly, Capriles can produce a, a significant turnaround. So um, there is hope. Um, I, I just want to ask one quick question on Venezuela, and then I'd ask you to please start shifting to some of your questions to some of the other countries and speakers. Um, are you assuming that the votes will be accurately uh, counted? That that Carpiles will be would be allowed to win if he if he actually had the votes. I have never been an electoral observer in um, uh, Venezuela. Um, one of the interesting things is that in all the elections since 2007, and especially the two elections in 2012, the opposition has accepted the results. That doesn't mean that. That doesn't mean, <laughs> right? That doesn't mean. That may be but, for, for, for either tactical or strategic reasons. Yes, I think, I think the biggest fear, rather than fraud, the biggest fear is um, in Venezuela, uh, the government is manipulating the notion of there's no secrecy of the vote if you're a Chavista. This is the big fear, the fact that the government can know whether Chavistas have gone to the polls on election day and they can go out and get them somewhat coercively. That, I think, is uh, uh, the biggest fear, but there could be fraud, yes, and there was a, a, a story last, uh, this week uh, on um, someone from the ruling party having a specific code, but let me just say that for the record, it's interesting and worth stating that uh, the opposition has accepted the results of the October and December elections in 2012. Okay, thank you. Um, now let's take a question on some of the other countries. Um, Marcelo? Good morning, Marcelo Zorovic, PhD student uh, at the University of Miami. Uh, my question is to Enrique and maybe to extend to Peter. Um, how do we evaluate, Enrique, the internal political gains that Christina Kirchner may have had versus the external tensions with traditional partners, such as Brazil, for example? Wait, are you getting at, I'm not sure I understand the question totally, are you, are you saying, how do you evaluate the trade-off between the kinds of gains exactly. she's able, okay, because the internally versus foreign, okay. Yeah, the protectionism okay. with Brazil or the trade tensions with Brazil uh, has increased, and so. Okay, Enrique, you want to start, and then Peter, if you want to add. Well, uh, thank you, Marcelo, for, for the questions. Um, Actually, the tensions, yeah, with Brazil, with, with Uruguay, with, you know, we had had several incidents with, you know, neighboring and, and, and partners. Uh, um, I think this is part of, of the consequence of uh, the crisis of the political system in, 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 in 2001 that they were still suffering, that politics has become largely uh, short-term oriented. Uh, it is very difficult to, to maintain uh, in, in conditions of, of, of party institutionalization a certain degree of, of, of governability. I think that the, the government have opted uh, out of necessity initially, and I think it continue out of it, focusing on, on short term. So I think you know it, it always plays out to uh, uh, and, and privileges at least. Uh, the, some domestic politics, uh, pol politics over uh, um, um, the external uh, foreigner uh, relations. 
and this, you know, we have had several incidents with Uruguay, with the conflict of, of the uh, Asamblea, uh, etc., in which Kirchner at the time uh, 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 was very uh, concerned about the effects of this mobilization and protest on, on, on his reputation and, and privilege the, the a nationalist discourse that generated some tensions with uh, with uh, Uruguay, and I, I think this, this has been the, the general or orientation of, of the government, and of course, after that, there are immediate uh, attempts to restore, you know, to back to norm normalcy, uh, the, the, the relationship with, with the country that are not maybe that visible in, in the media, uh, etc. And I think this is uh, what is going on, on on the political games also with Brazil, now with Uruguay, Uruguay yesterday we have an incident that actually was not generated by Argentina, but uh, some off-the-record comments by the Uruguayan president on, on Cristina, uh, uh, etc. So I think the part of these things are more, you know, for the for public opinion, but the undercurrent is trying to work out with different uh, Latin American uh, partners, especially Brazil and, and the Mercosur partners. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, I think it's uh, these are different mics. Okay. Yeah. Oh, here we go. No? Here we go. No, I think oh, it's right. so. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to I mean, comment on the, uh, on the immediate politics, and I, I, I frankly haven't, haven't followed it closely, but I, I, I will say this, that um, I, I thought Javier's comment about uh, opportunities for the U.S. Um, was an interesting one. And Brazil's foreign policy has been to essentially construct a South-South strategy. Uh, to try and use South America in particular, uh, expanding investments and supporting infrastructure investment. And um, I think if the ambassador were here, he would suggest to you that Brazil has actually been relatively accommodating uh, with Argentina, um, uh, that in fact it has not taken its position as the much stronger economy. And, um, but I, I would say this, I, I think in the end the problem is that um, um, it's a somewhat weak read that uh, uh, Brazilian foreign policy, Brazilian strategy. Uh, it's, it's fellow BRIC partners. Um, it has tremendous differences with. Uh, it's a very weak alliance that, that um, I don't think promises a great deal in terms of a balance to the United States, which often seems to drive US for, uh, Brazilian foreign policy is to kind of balance against the United States. And uh, the relationship with Mercosur has ended up with these um, inconsistent and incoherent trade policies that uh, have moments of conflict and tension and moments of, of accommodation, uh, none of which really serve long-term development goals, unfortunately. So um, that's it. Thank you. Is there a question on Mexico for Roberto in the back? Good morning. Uh, Jose Acosta, President of UPS. Uh, Mr. Salinas, uh, with Peña Nieto taking over the administration, what do you see uh, his efforts on the trade facilitation front, the cost of trade into Mexico because of the inadequate and, I wouldn't say inadequate, let's say antiquated customs infrastructure that they'd have and lack of technology actually impedes the growth of small and medium-sized customers out of Mexico to the rest of the world. What, do you see any part of his platform that he can address that within the two years that is given to him generally within the new administration to make significant changes in that platform? Thank you. That is, that is a very, very good question. I think it's on, yeah. Um, and, and I think a great deal depends on what we're gonna see uh, next month with the visit of President Obama in, 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 in Mexico. Uh, off the record, or quasi on the record, uh, people in transportations and communications are talking about taking the next steps for integration. I, I hope you asked the same question in, in our trade panel, and particularly uh, to Bob Pastor uh, later on. But uh, um, um, among other uh, issues that are being considered are the possibility of, uh, of, of fifth freedoms in, and, and, and possibly even open skies. And I mean, this, this, this was absolute, uh, uh, it was more conceivable for Martians to invade us than to conceive of regional open, or politicians in Mexico talking about regional open skies. And it's being talked about right now. There, there are, why? That's derived because of the fact that in, in, the, uh, in the trade cycle that we're in, it's much more important to focus on cost reduction in, in, in logistics. 
and, and, uh, and, and, and customs procedures and the transaction costs involved in, in, in doing trade in order to enhance your competitiveness. So you already made the big jump uh, as a result of uh, the first stages of uh, trade liberalization. So it's about, it's about focusing on those half points or one point or one point and a half or two points in, in your margins that are going to be gained through uh, 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 such uh, uh, operational efficiencies. Um, Excuse me, so Roberto, I, could you just define what Open Skies is? I you, you, just, you said Open Skies. O so open you, Skies, yeah, that, that, yeah that, that, that would mean some version of, uh, of at least in the transport of merchandise to be able to take, uh, to be able to use the same carrier same airline carrier, uh, let's say from Puebla to Mexicali and from Mexicali to Los Angeles and Los Angeles to Vancouver and Vancouver maybe to Tuxla Gutierrez. I mean, that's, that's just uh, uh, off the top of my head, but it's a transition towards that type of, uh, of uh, transportation uh, environment. It would be ideal if we had full open skies that would also include uh, um, uh, airlines being able to operate uh, uh, regionally, yeah. but at least it's being talked about and be talked about seriously. So I, I think that's a step in the right direction in terms of taking very seriously the, the, um, the uh, issues involved uh, in the next steps of, of, of regional uh, integration. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a, uh, um, I, I think it's, it's a travesty to see what has occurred in, in the border zone, for instance, with all the tremendous amount of trade that Mexico exports one billion dollars of manufactured exports per day. And yet you go to the border zone and it's all, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a medieval bottleneck, what you see there. It's not consistent with the expectation that was created 20 years ago in the wake of the North American Free Trade Agreement that we would have these facilities. So I, I, I do see serious hope. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not just a fantasy. I do see a serious um, concentration on these efforts. So, so no, there's an awareness on, on both sides of the border, or is the problem? I, I think, it'll, I think it'll, it'll, it'll depend more on the political willingness in the United States. Uh -huh. But I, I, see, I, see, I see more clarity, uh, not because I'm necessarily from Mexico, but I see more clarity on the Mexican front on the need to take these, news, uh, these next steps of integration. Great, thank you. Okay, question on anything? Yes, Nancy. Oh, wait, the mic, please. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Mengus from the Center for Security Policy, editor of the America's Report. I would like to address my question to Professor Kingstone in relation to Petrobras and the impression I have that they're moving forward rather slowly in terms of exploiting their offshore oil and I understand that China was supposed to help with that, but I was, I'm just wondering, you know, where things are. Thank you. You know, I, I, um, the unfortunate thing when you give a general talk is it raises all sorts of themes that you're not a specific <laughs> expert on, so I, I, I don't know if I can answer you as concretely as, as you'd like. The concern with Petrobras is that increasingly uh, the administration is using it as a tool of industrial policy. So it has begun uh, using administered prices uh, for a variety of reasons, including fighting inflation. Uh, it has uh, subcontracting rules and supply rules that are essentially designed to promote uh, Brazilian industry. Um, as that's happened, it has made <coughs> other operators nervous about the extent to which this is really a, a, a flexibilized sector, whether it's really an open sector. Um, and as that's happened, investment has fallen, production has fallen. Um, so I mean, the, the concern that I have with Brazil is, and, and again, I, I apologize to the ambassador's not here, so I can, I can speak you know, without having to apologize, but um, you know, like for example, the, the infrastructure investment program, uh, the government's putting up money and, and trying to get private investors to join and public-private partnerships to promote an infrastructure. Um, uh, there's a recognition that, that um, uh, this deep shore, uh, offshore oil, the deep, the deep oil uh, requires renewed investments and um, it increases incre increased private participation. But investors are kind of being a little, a little wary. They're staying away. 
So, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what the 2014, uh, I always get confused now. Is it the World Cup in 2014 and the 2016 Olympics? I don't know what it's going to look like, but Brazil has very serious infrastructure needs just around those, let alone the rest of the economy. I mean, the, the whole transport infrastructure is, is, a, is a terribly under, underdeveloped in Brazil, electricity. Um, and there's just not a lot of take up. So, I mean, I, I don't have the specifics for you, but the worry is that, that the hand of the state is getting heavier. And as it does, it, it seems to be discouraging private, private participation. Yeah, let, let me just add what Peter, to what Peter said. Last year, I think was the first year, either ever or in a long time, that Petrobras last, lost money. Um, these local content rules are very bad. Um, the, the, the government now requires, to a certain extent, that the ships, you know, a certain portion of the ships and the drilling rigs have local content, which also is slowing down things. Um, the rules change with regard to investment in certain blocks that you know, are up for auction, um, to a certain extent penalizing foreign bidders in terms of the quality of, of the blocks that they can bid on or be locked out of. Um, and I suppose the, the other thing, don't forget when the pre-salt discoveries were announced, that was, you know, the new play in town. I mean, the great p potential for development. Well, since then, the U.S. is, an, is a new play with the shale oil and the shale, shale gas. And um, I have a concern that, um, you know, uh, Brazil is, is, is lagging behind in the development of its resources, and maybe by the time they're ready to really get serious, more serious ab about this, um, there's not going to be that much interest. Why go five miles down through a, a thick layer of salt when you have much more easy access to the shale plays, not only in the United States, but if what you know, Roberto uh, foresees uh, the possibility of Mexico developing shale and um, Argentina, if it, if it gets its act together, uh, Argentina has the largest amount of shale resources in, in Latin America. So um, time, time may not be on, on Brazil's side in the exploitation of its, its pre-salt oil. Okay, questions on anything but Brazil right now? I'm sorry, I'm switching around because I want to give all the speakers, if, if possible, a, a chance um, to respond. Does anyone have a question? Or is that limiting your ability to ask? Oh, okay, uh, Barbara. I'll, op I'll open the rest to anything because our time is going. Thank you. Um, Barbara Kochwar from the Peterson Institute and Georgetown University. Um, my question is to Argentina and to Venezuela, which are two economies that have been doing relatively well despite all of the economic fundamentals. So economists look at Argentina and for the last little while have been saying, when is this going to end? And Argentina has benefited from favorable external conditions, right? But those seem to be tapering off a little bit. If you look at the growth of Argentina's main export markets, none of them are, are going gangbusters in the same way they were. China is still growing, you know, predicted at what, 8, 8.5%, but is that enough to sustain it? If you look at the difference between official inflation rates and estimated inflation rates by everybody who's not in the government, you know, this is a big deal. If you look at the, the currency doesn't seem sustainable despite claims that they're not going to devalue. And sort of, you know, fiscal spending, monetary expansion, it just seems as though the party should be over relatively soon. You know, can they make it to October and then can they make it until the end of the next administration? When do you think this will end? What do you think would be the political implications thereof. In Venezuela, I mean, Maduro is coming in in such a different economic environment than Chavez that even, or whoever wins the election, which people tell me probably will be Mr. Maduro, um, you know, with the balloons and all might be helping. Um, for how much longer could he continue to um, pursue Chavista policies, continue with even if Petro Caribe is a relatively small amount of the, the budget, um, for how much longer do you think those things could continue? Yeah, I, I just have to say, I, I, I misspoke, I looked at the time, this has to be the last question for this panel and then we have to um, move on. Um, Enrique. Um, yeah, 
there are you know, serious questions about the sustainability of, of, of the so-called Kirchnerista economic model. And, and th there have been already signs by in, in 2007. And, 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 and partly the 2008 crisis you know, helped Kirchnerismo because, well, it seems to be you know, a, a global ca a crisis, etc. They had been very clearly delaying you know, some of, 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 of the decisions I see need to be uh, taken in, in relation, per, per example, with, in relation with inflation, with uh, 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 fiscal situation, deterioration of the fiscal situation, the monetary expansion, etc. But now again, they are facing an electoral year. Uh, they are trying to, you know, delay until October uh, all these decisions. The, the latest decisions has been, as you know, the control of, of the exchange royal, exchange rate, control of, of, of imports, and a price a freeze and on, on, on certain. Uh, um, basic commodities, uh, uh, etc., and, you know, they are hoping that this will lead them to, to October. What will happen first? The first question, as you rightly posed, will it, they make it to October? Well, you know, the uh, uh, inflation expectations this year, according to my university, it has a, a ranking, is, you know, in consumers is 30 percent, and, and some uh, trade unions are demanding <coughs> raises up to 35, 36 uh, uh, percent, you have, you know, the, the activation of distributional uh, struggles in, in, in Argentina on salaries and prices, etc. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a quite a difficult year, even if they make it to October. Uh, well, what will happen next? Thank you. Javier? Um, let me begin by saying that um, Venezuela has a lot of room uh, for maneuvering in the sense of... Um, if the cost of production is of oil is estimated in Venezuela to be about $15 a barrel, and you're still fetching in the 90, uh, $90 per barrel, you know, you, you, you're, you still are making quite a bit of money. This is a, a good example of an economic rent. Having said that, we have already seen a major abandoning of a crucial Chavista policy with the devaluations. We have seen cutbacks in spending, but now this devaluation we know for a fact that Chavez repeatedly said, we're not going to devalue, we're not going to devalue. And the first thing that they did, even before Maduro became the Presidente Encargado, is they devalued. Uh, and there was a second devaluation. So we're already starting to see this. I am sure that they were saying, let's avoid this. We're about to have an election. And they couldn't. So they're, they're feeling the pressure. But what is remarkable about Venezuela, as with any Petro state, is that a devaluation like this one produces a significant fiscal relief that provides enough oxygen uh, in terms of the deficit for the government. It, 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 it really helps. Uh, it, it gives them more mileage. And so it's not like they are in a, uh, um, uh, in a situation of um, uh, uh, you know, a lethal situation where, where everything is in jeopardy. Yeah, I, I just want to add, um, many of you already know that I'm on the board of an energy company, so I've been following energy. Um, and I just want to add that um, 2012, at least the company I'm on the board of, which has, uh, what is it, seven, I think it's seven oil refineries on the Gulf Coast, not one of them operated with imported oil. And in the past, they used to operate, at least in part, with Venezuelan oil. And the U.S. Gulf Coast refineries are among the few that can process heavy oil, which is what Venezuela has. All right, so there's going to go. That, that's it. Gonna, it's going to be the end of Venezuelan exports to the U.S. Gulf refineries um, very shortly. I was just talking about, you know, one company's um, uh, refineries. At the same time, so you say, okay, well, they've got China. China has been shifting now. China sees what's going on with the U.S. in terms of oil and gas production. China has been making contracts now for Iraqi oil. Okay, there's some risk in that, of course, but that's light oil, and you don't have to build these refineries that process heavy oil. China is, is more and more, I think, given what's hap going to happen with U.S. production and has already started happening, turning to Middle Eastern oil, which is closer, 
and the oil is lighter. So I would raise some questions about the future of the Venezuelan oil industry, which I can't answer yet. This is just starting to happen. But it's not a given that, you know, bright days are here for Venezuelan oil. And that's not even counting the fact that their production has decreased one million barrels a day over the last few years, that the, that the, um, the oil industry in Venezuela is highly mismanaged. Heavy oil requires constant attention. It's not been getting it. So I would encourage those of you to start, um, if you're interested in it, to start following the actual situation geopolitically and you know, globally economic of, the, of, of PDVSA and, and the Venezuelan oil. Um, unfortunately, we have to end this, this uh, panel. I, I think most of the speakers are staying around for a few more hours. If you see them, we will have a coffee break after our next featured speaker. Um, so please feel free to go up and ask them whatever questions we didn't get to here. But in the meantime, won't you all please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. <laughs>